I hate you both. I've hated you ever since I can remember. I hate you, and I wish you both had cancer. Cancer? Yes, in the head. <gasps> I'm as bad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain! Are you telling me you built a time machine? Out of a DeLorean? This is the stupid answer show! Uh-oh. Sounds like somebody's got a case of the Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> People seem to like me because I am polite and I'm rarely late. Don't worry, I got an idea. And now, the host of the Stupid Cancer Show, Matthew Sack. Woohoo! Not that there's anything wrong with him. Because he has a lot of chit spot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hello and welcome to episode 373 of the Stupid Cancer Show, the voice of Young Adult Cancer. I'm your host, Matthew Zachary, a proud 20-year Young Adult Brain Cancer Survivor, coming to you right now from the Chemo Deck, our fabulous studio in downtown Manhattan. Broadcasting since 2007, the Stupid Cancer Show is a production of Stupid Cancer, the largest charity comprehensively addressing young enough cancer online at stupidcancer.org. I'm Kenny Kane, co-founder of Stupid Cancer, welcoming all of our first-time and returning listeners. Never miss an episode by subscribing to the podcast on iTunes and following us on SoundCloud. It is not okay that 72,000 young adults are diagnosed with cancer each and every year. So, got cancer? Under 40? Socks, huh? Well, it's time to get busy living, folks, because the Stupid Cancer Show is changing the world one chemo infusion at a time. We've got a great show, Cycle of Lives. On September 2nd, David Rickman will begin a 5,000-mile bike tour of the United States in an effort to raise awareness and funds for cancer research. Along his tour de force, he will meet with a variety of people who have been affected by cancer to write a book. David will join us tonight to share what is, uh, is inspiring him uh, to embark on this incredible ride and what he hopes to accomplish with his Cycle of Lives project. we got a survivor spotlight on author and young adult survivor, Sophie Vanderstaff. All righty. Welcome to the show. Hello, Kenny. Hello, Matt. Mallory. Hello. Sean. Hey. We have special guest David Fuhrer. Hello there. Oh, you on? How's that? How's that? Oh, much better. better. Thank you. Right, yeah. Yes. Thank you. So you actually count now because you're audible. Welcome to the Stupid Cancer Show. I exist. It's you, good to be here. <laughs> you've been validated by audio. Well done. Hello, Kenny. How are you? I'm hanging in there. How are you? I understand that you and Sean embarked on a very interesting experience this weekend, courtesy of our friend, is it Yelp? We it was did. a it was a voyage, a bon voyage. It was just a voyage. Or a mal voyage. It was just a voyage. Yeah, it was a good voyage. What was it all about? It was uh, a holiday hangover cruise. There were all sorts of great beverages and food, and a really cool charity that they hosted. Um, Would that be us? It? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. So Yelp just throws boat cruises every now and then. Yeah, no big deal. Just like that. Yeah, there was a uh, like dinosaurs and unicorns and weird dancers i saw you sent me some video of some weird sh people wearing a sheet doing something yeah it got it got a little weird okay but it was fun it was a good time kenny did this make up for the uh the um rainstorm typhoon of omg 2011 you know i i had fond memories of omg 2011 and uh it was definitely a throwback and i thought to myself that we need to bring it back for omg east 2016 perhaps let's work with you up on that amen yeah very nice, very nice. They well, uh, they raised over a thousand dollars for us as yeah, well. Yeah, we love Yelp. Yeah, so it's good stuff. We're very happy. Great partnership. Uh, CancerCon update. Mallory, hello. It's happening. Yeah. Yes. How are we doing on numbers? Uh, we are starting to get to the point where we're getting close to selling out. There are not a lot of spots left. So that, wow. Yeah, and uh, 
people are signing up for all of the exciting tours, which is a lot of fun. I think that's the coolest part of how this event has evolved over the couple of years. It's become more experienced than just, well, I mean, I say just a conference. The conference is great itself, but people there's a come. Lot more. There's a lot more to it. So much more than meets the eye. Uh, actually, Sean, I was hoping you could talk briefly about Team Stupid Cancer because that's growing by leaps and bounds. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've uh, been granted the most ever amount of initial spots um, in our recent history So uh, for the New York City Marathon. So we now have 10 runner spots uh, for that. Um, we've currently raised $16,000 for the New York City half, which is happening March 20th. Uh, That's awesome. Not too far away. And uh, what's really cool is we have a group of 12 survivors out in Southern California. Um, some are from, from outside, but mostly based in San Diego um, that are running what's called the Ragnar Relay. Um, they're running from Huntington Beach to San Diego, or it's the other way. I forget. I think it's the first. Um, and it's a two-day run, and they're taking turns running and sleeping in the car. Do they uh, run down the PCH all the way? How do they How do they get there? That's a good question. Yeah. I would assume that that might be. I it. mean, they're not swimming. No, they're running. It'd be fun if they ran down the beach the whole way. Just do this long, like two day Baywatch montage. That would be exhausting. Yeah, that's just, <laughs> that sounds terrible. Sand. That's absolutely awful. <laughs> yeah, so they're raising money <clears throat> and awareness and all that good stuff. That's twelve survivor team, and it's been it's been confirmed by Ragnar Relay. That this is their first ever all survivor team. In wow! History. So there's some cool. PR waiting to happen with that. Oh yeah, that's oh, pretty cool. Oh, and exciting news because uh, this is breaking. We are one dollar away from breaking fifty thousand for the CancerCon VIP club. One dollar. You hear that, folks? Someone donate a dollar <laughs> right now. Just a dollar. <laughs> all right. You know what? I'll donate that dollar. We hit fifty thousand. Fantastic. This, this nine 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 is is bothering Just me. Just screenshot right now. that and put OCD in your Facebook <laughs> post. Fantastic. So yeah, David Fuhrer dropping in tonight. He's uh, down from Rochester. Uh, Dave is a two time testicular cancer survivor on our board of directors. Mm -hmm. It's been a great journey um, getting to know you. And this show represents our three year. Hard to believe. Uh, first day anniversary. Yeah, you've been ruining my life. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I had no, no, that's Kenny's job. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea how deep the rabbit hole would go. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. So why don't you tell us your story? Yeah, um, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer at 25, and then at 30 diagnosed with a different form of testicular cancer. Um, <laughs> uh, I can laugh about it now. Uh, it was uh, the experience nobody ever wants, but uh, I'm very happy to be a part of our family now and, and be able to look back on it. So when you were on the show three years ago, you were in a very different place. You were yeah. working in the corporate universe of corporate everything, Dilbert land, <laughs> venture capital, startups, you know, but you were still involved somehow in oncology, yeah. but you weren't like out of the cancer closet. No. And, and thank you for calling me out and making me admit that. So yeah. on the air, <laughs> I'm live. Yes, yeah, so it was yes. wonderful. <laughs> no, but you had like this gestalt moment after that for a couple of weeks and months, and we yeah. slowly started to build a friendship around that and um you know i always talk about how a lot of people want to put it behind them or live in denial but they're happy in a certain way we meet a lot of people who oh i can't when i was nine but i don't think about that right but they don't realize the value that they could potentially have to someone else in that space yeah was that sort of because you had a massive catharsis can mm. you talk us through that a little yeah, bit? i mean the, the revelation to me you know i was diagnosed nine and 14 years ago which seems like a long time ago but i only really started to deal with it three years ago when i joined our community and and so it's amazing how much even though it seems like by years it was a long time ago um this being open and dealing with it has been such a short amount of my life so so you joined the board of directors yes because you jump right into the deep end of the pool <laughs> Um, you know, but uh, actually that was um, a blessing in disguise because um, I didn't know how much help and support I really needed and wanted. And just becoming a part and being able to connect um, opened the door to all of that. And so, you know, it's, you know, like we always say, you don't know what you need until you find it. And, right. you know, that's been this experience for me. And now you're catching ghosts. Tell me more. No, that's what, from, what ghosts am I no, catching? No, that's the line from Ghostbusters. Oh. Remember? When, when, when. <laughs> Crickets. Um, no, no one gets my jokes. Eighties joke. Come oh, on. Yeah, yeah. No, it's when uh, the guy, the the dickless guy, you know, <laughs> you know, comes in front of them. And like, Shut off the power grid. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Never mind. I take it back. So anyway, so I, it's very exciting that, to see your your journey come this way, and now you're helping so many other people. Yeah. You've done 
keynotes with me. You did you keynote at CancerCon this year. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your passion these days? Um, I think besides Kenny. Well, hey, n now that's out number two. Thank you for outing yeah. that on the air. <laughs> um, being or accepting myself was an incredibly hard thing to do, but getting there now gives me strength to help others. And so if I'm able to help people, um, being open and based on what I've gone through, then that's my passion. I don't think it gets much better than that. Mm, thank you. Well, thanks for being here. You can stick around. I will be here. Okay, great. Yes. Let's get to our first guest, Kenny. After Sophie Vanderstrop was diagnosed with a rare and aggressive form of cancer at the age of 21, she began to lose her self-esteem, her identity, and then finally, her hair. Sophie wrote The Girl with Nine Wigs, in which she chronicles her unique coping mechanisms that she used to help her get through cancer treatment with nine wigs, with different looks, names, and personalities. Please welcome to the Stupid Cancer Show, Sophie Vanderstrop. Sophie. Hi. Welcome to the show. Thanks for uh, thanks for your willingness to share your story here with us on the air. It's good to meet you. No, it's likewise. a funny name, Stupid Cancer. I was very curious for the name, for the voice behind it. <laughs> yeah, how did you uh, find out about us in the first place? Um, recommended by a friend. All right, we like your friend. <laughs> yes, me too. So I was diagnosed at 21. It's a number that's uh, kind of a trigger. Um, and uh, I typically like to ask our guests to tell us what their life was like leading up to that diagnosis when everything was, quote, normal. Yeah, it's such a funny number, no, to be diagnosed. This life should change at 21, or uh, should start. Um, well, I was in Amsterdam. I was studying, I think, like most of us at 21. And um, I was in and out of university, traveling a lot, uh, mainly around Asia, and working in like three different restaurants. It was a busy life. And then I started to feel the first signs of the cancer. It started with fatigue. And I actually was convinced I'd picked up a bacteria in one, on one of my travels. As cancer, as you must know, is so far away from um, being 21. That is true. Uh, so your initial symptoms were basically just fatigue, or did you have bruising? What What was your actual diagnosis itself, by the way? <laughs> um, uh, sorry, I have to laugh because it's funny to talk to someone who went through the same thing at 21. We probably have some of the same symptoms. Uh, I had difficulty breathing. I had steps in my, it turned out it was my liver, but steps in that part of my body. And I was, yeah, there was a lot of fatigue, but fatigue... Funnily enough, it's the most difficult to recognize, I think. Well, I was diagnosed with Epstein-Barr because I was so fatigued before I was actually diagnosed with brain cancer. So I, I completely understand that. Uh, how long did you go being diagnosed or misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed before they actually found what was actually wrong with you? Uh, that was a joke. It was about eight weeks. It was the whole of December, and then there was Christmas in between. And then I didn't find out before the, well, I will always remember that date, of course, the 26th of January. So that was a big joke. I went, I was in like three different departments in the hospital, and I met about seven doctors, I think. So which doctor actually diagnosed you correctly, and what was your diagnosis? Um, well, they told, the it was the lung department, so the lung doctor. And his diagnosis was rhabdomyosarcoma. But then when I met my oncologist, he said, we're not entirely sure of your diagnosis. And they never were. I had like three different opinions. But he said, I don't really care how we call the beast as long as we kill it. Wow. Okay. So, <laughs> so if they didn't actually know your, your diagnosis, how do they know what to prescribe or offer you as far as post-treatment or surgery? Well, of course they knew the symptoms, right? So it, it wasn't that the diagnoses were very far from each other. They all agreed that there was rhabdomyosarcoma tissue, but one would say it was an epithelioid sarcoma. The other one said there was it was rhabdomyosarcoma. And as it belongs to the group of where uh, soft tissue sarcomas, they're all treated with the same chemo bomb, or at least... Uh, 10 years ago when I was treated. Right. Wait, so you just celebrated 10 years last week or two weeks ago? You know what? I should have. <laughs> it 
Yeah, I thought about it. Of course, the date crossed my mind, but I maybe you um, relate to that as well. You don't want to make it into a thing anymore. Well, yeah, we, we were just talking about that in the opening segment. Lots of people that are diagnosed young kind of want to put it behind them. But then they, some of them realize that it's an opportunity to help someone just like them get through it. I, which leads me to my next question is you seem to indicate in what I'm reading here that you went through this very pretty alone. Did you, I mean, friends and family notwithstanding, if you had access to them, did you get to meet any other cancer patients that weren't 80? <laughs> Well, not in the hospital. Everybody around me was about 70 years old. And one of these patients actually told me, was an older man. He once told me, you're lucky, girl. Being so young, you have a strong body and much more chance to survive. I could just punch him in the face. I was going to ask, uh, how, how large of an object did you want to throw at his head? Yes, <laughs> exactly. It was like surreal. But um, I never went to a cancer organization for young people because I never wanted to be a young person with cancer. So I met two people that I grew very fond of, but I met them through uh, my own social networks or other social networks in Amsterdam. Yeah, that, that speaks to the 10 years ago was around the time when I started to begin the process of launching this organization off the heels of a lot of studies around young adults with cancer that it was finally getting recognized that we are an age group that exists to begin with in the cancer world. We do get cancer and no one knows that and no one really cared about that and we're going to get 80 year olds telling us to get over it. So a lot of that led to my starting stupid cancer in 2007 so i wouldn't expect you to know we existed way back then and there were very few organizations back then that were even in the mind's eye of doctors or nurses to let you know exist so it goes back to you weren't just alone and not aware that there are other people your age but no one else knew to tell you that there were other people your age that you could talk to. Sophie, this is Dave. I had an identical experience um, being treated the same as senior citizens. And actually, my <laughs> wife my, my wife and I went to get massages yesterday, and we had to check the box for me that said history of cancer. And I, so I checked it, and the girl checking us in said, oh, my grandfather had cancer too. Thank you for reminding me of every day <laughs> of my treatment. Yes, exactly. Yes, that's what you get, right? Oh, I know cancer. My grandma stopped. My grandmother died last year. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I could get it if my grandmother lived last year, but it's always your grandfather died or your grandmother. <laughs> no one ever says, "Oh, cancer! My grandma lived." I, I, that's like a joke waiting to be done. In, on anyway, so so <laughs> let's let's get to your your. I hate the word journey, but like the next steps here. I I always this has to be brought up because this is an issue that is unique to being twenty one or thirty one with cancer, fertility. Clearly, ah. when you're not 80, it's an issue. I, I hate beating up on the 80 year olds, but I'm just beating up the 80 year olds. Like, when you're not 80, your reproductive stuff is relevant if cancer makes you sterile. Was there, and 10 years ago, I would not expect it to happen 10 years ago, but was that even brought up to you 10 years ago? Actually, it was, but did it cross your mind? I mean, as a man, did this cross your mind? I was in a unique position because I was diagnosed in pediatrics. So when you're in pediatrics and you're over 13, all the boys are told. And that's okay. just something they've been doing for 30 years, but they don't tell the girls. So if you're a boy, I was 21, but if you're a boy in pediatrics, they tell you. So I was lucky. Dave went through a different experience because he was diagnosed in his 20s and then early 30s. Yeah. So. He, he was told, oh, the first time, don't worry about it. But the second, second time, tar sorry, it's too late. Yeah. If you can think of the two most pointed comments in my life, I remember the doctor the first time saying, you know, it's not an issue. You don't have to worry about it. And then five years later saying, sorry, too late, can't do anything. Oh, that's charming. <laughs> that's the best yes. word to describe it. Very charming. But for men, on top of it, for men, it's so easy. Well, well. I, I, I half cut that with water because we have to do it with – emotional intention and not physical intention <laughs> and when you're told you'll be dead in six months it's hard to come at a cup 
well, yeah, I I guess I but by I comparison, don't share the no. same experience. Yeah. By comparison, mentioned. it is nothing compared to what women have to go through. But at the same no, time, I remember they told me, but it was like five minutes or not even probably 30 seconds after he told me that I was probably going to die. So also it didn't really matter to me at that point. Right. And secondly, he just wanted to get me on the IV as soon as possible, which was like three days later. Mm. So there was no time for the intervention and I could have probably stretched it, but I wasn't thinking of babies at 21 and it didn't seem a priority after the news he had just broken to me. Did they tell you your side effects in advance? Like, here's what you might experience. Or they just said, look, you're going to be bald and weak and tired and miserable and throwing up. What was that conversation like leading you into this? Well, it was more the second bit that you said. And of course, I mean, it was so much for him a necessity or he was so in urge to get me immediately on the IV drip that it wasn't a conversation of sharing well you should know that this and this and this could happen he shared more and more knowledge with me more and more information once I was on the drip so I mean again I'm reading your your story here and we want to I want to get to your book it seems like you really had um a lot of isolation going through this that you found comfort and identity in these in the wigs that you chose and then you wrote your book in uh discussing how this helped you we say get busy living but you know navigating through all this nonsense was that really all you had from the perspective of like i might be losing my life the least thing i could do is cling to these wigs yeah well what made sense to me was that if i was maybe only going to live for another few years i wanted to live them well and as a young girl and uh, that's what my wigs were for. They, uh, it turned out that they actually not were just for hiding and for hiding my illness for other people, but that they helped me forget as well. So, and um, they were something fun in times, in shitty times. So did you write this book 10 years ago? Or you just started to take like, I'm reading here like you, 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 you didn't like writing, but somehow you just became a wellspring of penmanship. And it's like just... I wrote it in the hospital. Wow. So clearly this was your journal. This was the yes. way you were maintaining some some level of sanity going through this. Uh, okay. what, was it nine wigs on purpose or you just happened to find nine wigs? No, it was like when I started writing, it was the girl with four wigs and then it was seven wigs. And then when I ended the manuscript, it was nine wigs. So actually the whole book... I think the strength of the book is that it's completely real. It was so important for me at the time to keep the documents completely real. So the names in the book, everything, the dates are true. So how long was it between, and clearly you you're, you're, you lived, you're alive, you're here 10 years, gets good. How long was it between when you were you started writing this book and you felt it was, quote, done? Or is it ever really done? Ah, well, for me, this book is done because now I'm 10 years further and I'm three more books further. But I think what you're saying, yeah, it's, it's a very uh, important question in a way because when I started, when this book was published in the US last September, I reread it and I reworked on it. I've rewritten stuff or I edit stuff. And in that case, you can say a book is never finished because you can always add your new reflections to a story, you know? Oh, no, I, I agree completely. So we have about the five minutes left. I want to ask you more about what have you been doing? First of all, how long was your treatments and, and when did you consider, did they say, oh, you're cured, go home? Or was there like a more of a lingering what now? Uh, there was the second, but I think it had to do a lot with my doctor and his choice of words and his lack of, um, so, his lack of, social competence or human communication on a sort of human level. <laughs> right. I hear you. So um, the treatment was about a year. Then, so I was 23 when I got out of treatment and that Democlas word was there for another two, three years. And then I was sort of able to let it go and to decide that it was a part of a thing of the past. But I never went back to the university because I never went back to that idea that I was going to have a 
full length life that I could map out. So writing was perfect and I just continued writing. Here at Stupid Cancer and part of the Young Adult Support Universe, we, we discuss how most people don't know what they need because they're not aware things exist. And it saddens me that you went through this journey over the last decade without having uh, sort of introductions or communications with or, or involvement with, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people that we work with every year all across the world that know what it's like to be told you'll be dead in six months when you're 21 or a doctor that says, oh, whatever, just get over it. Like, this is the empathy that we have for your experience because we were that experience ourselves. Um, what have you been doing in the six or seven years since you wrote the journal and then made it a book? Uh, I've been writing other books. I moved to Paris where I spent seven years. I've been writing a lot of nonfiction, like short essays for newspapers. And then I left Paris in September for New York, where I still am. And um, I'm now working on a novel that I hope to finish in April. So it's interesting to me that you took time off to live your life and write these other books. What inspired you to come back and revisit this to publish it last year? That wasn't, that, um, that was just um, the American publishing house that decided to suddenly want to publish it. Oh. Otherwise, it would have been published wow. a bit long time ago. So, yeah, so I'm reading here, The Girl with Nine Wigs has been published in 25 countries. We made it to a German movie. The, yes. The book was nominated for a Dutch Literacy Award, and Sophie has received, you have received several awards for the story, and you did a TEDx conference about it. How, how has the, um, the response been? Um, well, beautiful, actually, because I, without even uh, wanting to, it wasn't my desire or my goal. I got in touch with a lot of readers, of course, with a lot of people. As I opened up with my story, other people open up to you. And so I think in a way, it's true that I've never had the experience through an organization like yours, which would actually have appealed to me very much because I love the name and I'm sure I would have felt welcomed to uh, get in touch but um, I've had it through my readers and they sent me letters and they opened up to me and I think that's a beautiful experience and I, I still think that's a very powerful tool to open up to people and to share your fear and your vulnerabilities in your story and I think you get rewarded by beautiful stories in return. I couldn't agree more and very well said. Uh, in our last minute or so, can you share with us and our listenership, which is worldwide, your voice is going to be heard by lots and lots of people tonight. It, what What is your message to that next 21-year-old that's told you'll be dead and there's no hope and we don't know what you're actually diagnosed with? And yeah, good luck with that. What, what, is your, what would you say to that 21-year-old today? Well, firstly, that that's only one opinion of one person. And secondly, that uh, I, my experience is there wasn't at all the end of things. Uh, I already discovered on the second day that I could still laugh the second day of my diagnosis. And um, I think it's not just my story or other successful stories, but I think it's very human to immediately go into survival and not to sit only in fear and to find something joyful. And I would uh, recommend that to everybody, to find something joyful. And my wigs were like a uh, cancer vacation. It's just, it was, you know, the cancer was always there, of course, 24 hours. But during those wigs, wearing those wigs, I could fool others. And by fooling others, I could fool myself. And even if it was only a few hours a day, or sometimes only five minutes a day, I knew that I, I sort of could say to the cancer, you're here always, but this is my time. And for me, there was a way to deal with the difficult situation. Unconsciously, I must say, at the time. I only understood it later. And I think that's something very important and very useful for people going through a difficult situation. That you don't accept it 24-7, but that you try to find a refuge where you can still be the person or lead the life that you want to lead. Well, the book is The Girl with Nine Wigs, available in the hardcover on Amazon. Is, do, you have a, do you have a blog or a website we can direct people to? 
Uh, yes, it's sophievanderstep.nl, but it's not a lively blog. So not a lively blog. <laughs> no, right. I would just, I would just read the book. <laughs> yes. Well, we'll also reference that you were in People Magazine last October. Just Google the girl with nine wigs, Sophie Vanderstrup. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And we're in New York. I look forward to meeting you one day, perhaps. Yeah, me too. Let's have a coffee. Okay. Take care. Take care. All bye right, bye. Bye. All right, Kenny. And now, the news. Hello, I'm Kent Brockman, and this is I on Cancer. Just the facts, ma'am. Head on over to events.stupidcancer.org. That is events.stupidcancer.org. Sign up for meetup alerts and never miss an event again. If you'd like to learn more about hosting your own stupid cancer meetup, visit stupidcancer.org forward slash meetup. All right, we've got some events happening. We have Schaumburg, Illinois. Wheat Ridge, Colorado, San Diego, California, and Anchorage, Alaska. No one should face cancer alone because isolation sucks. Download Instapeer for iPhone, iPad, and Android. Create your account and instantly start chatting with someone just like you who's been there and walked in your shoes. Join our community of thousands of cancer patients, survivors, and caregivers right now. Instapeer. We launch a new street aggregator on Tumblr for all the articles, blogs, and stories we couldn't possibly have the time to post on social media. Check out what we're reading 24-7 and don't miss a beat. Subscribe at stupidcancer.org forward slash feed. For young adults, clinical trials are a red hot mess. So we at Stupid Cancer are throwing our hat in the ring to make some sense of the madness. Introducing I Am Not a Trial. Real young adults, real faces, and real stories plucked straight from our own community. Watch the entire video series at IamNotAtrial.com. Support our programs and services by heading over to StupidCancerStore.org. You'll feel great and look great in your new Stupid Cancer gear. That's StupidCancerStore.org. Be proud. Wear Stupid Cancer. And that is your Stupid, stupid Cancer, cancer News. news. David Richmond is preparing for a 5,000-mile solo bike ride across America because of reasons. And his, he's writing a book chronicling 15 people's emotional journeys dealing with cancer. This had to be a segment. I can't wait to talk to this guy. Please welcome David Richmond to the Stupid Cancer Show. David. Yes, Matthew. Thank you. How are you? No, it's a pleasure. I've been looking forward to this for quite a while now. So have I. Thank you. I appreciate uh, you giving me the time. I know how busy of a guy you are. No, I, well, the show is important. We have a large listenership, and, and people want to hear these stories. This excites me because it's an opportunity on so many fronts to, to raise awareness and do all the right things. So, Well, thank you. Yeah, you know, I'm very excited. I've got, uh, I got a lot of book subjects that I'm very, very deep into their stories, um, many that would, uh, I think, fulfill your – your mission and your values and your, you know, what what's in, in, in your organization's DNA, which is younger people and um, some that are not, uh, not profiled like that, but, uh, but some very, very interesting stories, some very unique people. And we're dealing with not the, um, like not necessarily the care and the treatment and, you know, kind of breakthroughs and that type of stuff. We're really dealing on, their the arc of their life story you know uh, pre-cancer was them at point a and post-cancer even if it was a researcher or a doctor or nurse or something uh, after cancer came into their life is them at point b and then we kind of cr- i'm trying to chronicle their journey and talk about you know mostly how they deal with the things they deal with and why they deal with the things that they deal with and uh so just the stories are absolutely remarkable, Matthew, and um, uh, I'm moved every time I talk to somebody, and uh, the people are just remarkable, and, I, and I'm and i hoping that uh, when it's all said and done, that the uh, that the reader will have, uh, uh, you know, some something to identify with, be inspired by, be moved by, and uh, be helped by. Well, before we get started, I, I want to talk about the things that we have, like, in, in common yeah. Uh, we've both been affected by brain cancer. I yes. uh, just celebrated 20 years. You lost your sister. I want to talk about her story. Mm-hmm. Um, we both have twins. Mine are five. Yours are in their teen years. And we both have Jewish mothers. So that. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. That is uh, that is something in common. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, my sister was June. Um, she was uh, diagnosed in 2007 um, and uh, had two young kids, uh, husband, good career and everything. And we were pretty close, but, um, you know, we all had our own lives. And, and uh, But we got closer and closer over the years that she went through treatment and surgeries. And she had a great cancer center uh, here in Southern California to take care of her, uh, made a board study of her and really enhanced her care and, 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 uh, experience. And, um, she passed away in 2007. Uh, and every year since then, I've done a, a, a fundraiser to try to either help, you know, one organization or another, um, to, and to keep her memory alive and to raise awareness and, and keep the cause going. You know, your your resume is a LinkedIn profile like a puzzle piece. You, you, <laughs> you've been in real estate, construction, uh, skin care, and you ran an animation company and then financial services. So is there anything you don't do? <laughs> Apparently, uh, decide what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> right. Well said. Yeah. Um, you know, my experience has been been, been everywhere. Nothing, Nothing's really... T touched me as the thing that I ought to do other than the one thing I never find enough time to do. And that's right. And, uh, I've written three books. Um, uh, this one will be my, my next. And, um, that's the thing that I love doing. Um, and it's only been in the last several years and I'm, I've been writing on and off and letting life get in the way and distract me for many, many, uh, years, uh, sometimes for many years at a time. And interestingly enough, I was doing a, uh, a relay for life for the American Cancer Society, and um, uh, and one of the uh, participants, she had read my book. She was a friend of mine, and she goes, "Yeah, you know," she goes, "The thing I don't like about you is that you wasted your life. You should have been writing." And I'm like, "All right." So I'm I, I do I, I am focusing more on that than anything else because I think we all we all realize at some point in our lives how little time we actually do have and we really need to do the things that move us and the things that um, that we really want to do before it's too late. So that's that's my focus right now is, is on writing. You just mic dropped that you have a book, and that's not even in your bio. <laughs> Tell us about this book. Oh, thanks. Yeah, uh, the book is called Winning in the Middle of the Pack, and uh, it, it, it was pretty successful. I... I I figured in life, everybody's got an interesting story. Mine was interesting, but not crazy interesting. And in business, people have accomplished a heck of a lot more than me, but I did I did accomplish a lot in business. And then in endurance athletics, people have done a lot more than me. I've done tons of Ironmans and 50-mile runs, 100-mile runs, 24-hour uh, runs, crazy stuff. But people have done a lot more than me. But when I take those three things together – um, I feel like I have a kind of a unique perspective. And so my concept of winning in the middle of the pack, if you have a quick second for it, is uh, I think kind of a unique one. Um, you know, there's these extreme overachievers. Gosh, I might put you in that uh, in, in that capacity, Matt, is that, is that pe people at the f wide end of the spectrum, either supremely underachieving or supremely overachieving, they're very – self-driven and self-motivated they do things for themselves even though they oftentimes are very uh, much geared on other people you know uh, uh, focused on other people but they really do things for themselves and I found in my life and in a lot of people's lives I know where we're in the middle of the pack we kind of do things to make our teachers happy or because we think our parents want us to do it or because we think that will make us a better father or a better husband or a better employee or whatever and my theory is we kind of just need to do things for ourselves first. And so that winning in the middle of the pack concept is, well, when you're in the middle of the pack, nobody's looking, right? Matthew, you have a lot of attention on you. People are looking at you all the time. But guys like me, nobody's looking and nobody really cares. I really should focus on the things that I need to do that I want to do that make me feel good about myself, that make me accomplish the things I want to accomplish. And that's where that winning in the middle of the pack concept comes from is I can win no matter what I'm going to do because nobody's really looking but me. So I, I, I should do the things that make me happy. I should do the things that fulfill me. So my book is just uh, talking about 
kind of the similarities between running a hundred miles and running a hundred million dollar business and the lessons learned in life. And that's what the book's about. If I may, I, I, I would <laughs> like to just go back to your sister. Um, yeah. how are, uh, this was nine years ago that she passed. Yeah. How, how did the family make out in terms of the young children and the, the, the late, the husband? Yeah. Ah, geez, you know, I'd like to say it was better than it was. I mean, honestly, Matthew, um, her and her husband just had like this kind of storybook romance. My, <clears throat> my sister and I had a pretty rough childhood and, um, she found, you know, great love with her husband and his family found a lot of, uh, comfort and joy and, you know, kind of started her own family, um, like I said, they, they kind of had a storybook life together. When this uh, happened, um, you know, she fought pretty courageously and very optimistically and, and all of that. But she had young kids and and her husband, you know, she was the center of her husband's world. And when she passed them, you know, they kind of just they kind of shut down and, um, you know, they're still kind of shut down and and understandable but it's it's it, i'm sure i can't even imagine how rough it was on them um you know as her brother it was pretty rough on me i chose to go away of like embracing her memory and trying to keep things going i think they found that really tough you know and so um one of the biggest things i try to uh, talk about with people is i mean the amount of support that you have and the the open communication and the resources and the, you know, the, the open meetups. And I mean, all of those things are so great for people. And it's just, uh, I think it, it just the more and more and more that the words out people, you know, will uh, partake in those things. But, but geez, eight, nine years ago, I, I just think it was not as advanced right now in communication as it is today. No, David, you bring up a really good point. And, and our, <clears throat> our, our, caller our first guest on the show talked about was diagnosed 10 years ago in, in 2006 when mm -hmm. I was just starting the the ruminations of what this organization could be which was based on a lot of policies that came out of the government about how no one really was paying attention to people if they lived or caregivers or the bereaved and now it's a it's a massive research universe that we're sort of leading the pack on how do we identify the way in which people can get busy living under any circumstance affected by cancer? So, yeah. I mean, and that's a nice sort of a segue mm -hmm. into that. What you led with is that, you know, this isn't really about finding a cure. It's helping people live as best as possible. We like to say, how can we make it suck a little less? <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and it's great. And I, and I, you know, I've, I've, uh, I love your message. I love the tone of your message. And it's like, we're not going to go hide in a corner and we're not going to let you throw us into the corner and forget, you know, it's, it's like, we're going to just do the best we can and deal with this reality. I've got one of my book subjects, Matthew said it so perfectly. And this is exactly why I'm like so excited to, to write this book and deal with the subjects that I'm dealing with and bike around the country to raise awareness is she said it so perfectly. This is the second time around. <clears throat> uh, she had thyroid cancer the first time about 15 years ago. Now she has two kids and she just, uh, she just finished her last chemo last week or sorry, last radiation last week for, for, for breast cancer. And the second time around she got uh, diagnosed and she got up out of her doctor's office and walked to a room next to her, uh, uh, in the room next to the to the doctor's office, sat down. She said, cried her eyes out for five minutes. A million thoughts went through her head. And then she went back into the doctor's office, grabbed a paper and pen and said, this is the, this is the, what I need to do for my treatment, what my, di what my prognosis is. Here's what I need to do for insurance. How am I going to deal with my kids and my ex-husband and my friends and communicating at work and blah, 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 blah. She made this whole long list of all the things she, she's going to need. And she goes, you know what, David? For last year, I can deal with everything on that list and I check it off and it's all good. She goes, but I could write a book about the five minutes I spent in that office by myself crying my eyes out. She goes, but I just, I don't think I'll ever have the time to do it. And that's what I'm doing. I'm writing a book about that five minutes. 
Well, we've done yeah. so many uh, surveys and polls. I mean, I, I come from the advertising universe before I, w I was. I'm a, I think you know my story. I was a concert pianist and I couldn't play yep. anymore after my diagnosis, but I spent a decade in advertising. And that's my been my approach to starting this nonprofit is who are the people in your neighborhood? Who are cancer patients? What are their issues? What are their challenges? We have all this anecdotal information from hearsay, but no one's really doing the market research around this. And that has been at the core of our understanding of this market over the last nine years. And we, a simple survey that we put out there, where do you spend your money? And 66% of it is spent on access to care, getting to care, and the care itself. That leaves the other third to spend on things that you can't afford anymore, like rent. <laughs> and child care and whatever food th basic necessities and no one is really doing a lot of that health economic you know information around mm -hmm. how do we fill that gap because it may not necessarily be let's just give them all money there's a larger understanding at the circus tent level of what is causing all this debt yeah and, you know you're right and it's that way with time too the, you know uh, uh even and again um whether it's survivors or parents or children's or loved ones and friends of survivors or, you know, people going through treatment or whatever, it's the same way with their time, right? How much of their time is spent dealing with the tasks that they need to deal with? And then you kind of sit back at some point and have a little, you know, PTSD and go, well, you know, wow, how am I going to deal with the things that I'm dealing with? And, and I've got some uh, book subjects. I mean, you, I think you know one of them. And she's dealing with a really heavy topic and one that I think the reader is just going to love. It's like, geez, everybody that went through I, what I went through didn't make it. And I did. Why? You know, wh how can I live my life in a meaningful way? And, and, and sometimes she feels guilty. And sometimes she feels blessed and lucky. But that's the thing that she's dealing with. But during this, all of her treatment and even post-treatment and everything, she never really allowed herself the time. Obviously, she had accumulated a tremendous amount of debt as well, which probably allowed her not to have time as well. But she didn't take the time to deal with these issues. And I think people can relate to that. And that's, uh, you know, I mean, this is, this is, these are meaningful, powerful stories that I, that I think need to be told. Well, we have our huge conference coming up. I don't know if you were planning on coming to Denver for CancerCon, but we have a significant percentage of the content is for caregivers, bereaved or otherwise, and survivor guilt, which is exactly what you're talking about. Why me? Yeah. Why am I here? Whether you're the caregiver or whether you're the patient, why me is something that millions of people go through and no one addresses really well unless mm -hmm. you happen to be at a cancer center that has it every Tuesday at eight o'clock with 80 people in a room that you don't relate to. So that, right. that, that yeah. to me is the new cancer research. The new cancer research is mental health, connectivity, sense of self. It's less about the medicine and more about your mindset and your lifestyle. And for me, that's what excites me the most because cancer survivorship research is really the new black. It's the next big thing that we talk about immunotherapy, genomics, molecular medicine, screening, sequencing, all these fancy science things. That's that side. But this side is the cancer lifestyle. And it doesn't matter how you plug in. It's how do we better understand it and make it less suck less for the next you. Well, obviously, with uh, with the demographic as well, is that they're going to be living with it for a very long time, hopefully, right? Most people. Um, and so those are skills and tools that are so valuable because, uh, you know, I mean, you know this more than anything, the the, the trauma and the change and the, the, you know, just the just the big themes that run through your life as you're going through, you know, varying uh, stages and, and uh, you know, depth of this disease um, can have very, very long standing effects. And if you don't have the tools to deal with them emotionally, right, we have the tools, we're getting so much better at dealing uh, medical tools to deal with it. But emotionally, if we don't have those tools to deal with, you know, years and years can go by and, we don't know how, you know, we don't know how to solve the problems that that this is all creating. And so I, I love what you guys are doing. I love it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let's take the last three minutes to talk mm -hmm. about how uh, you're clearly an underachiever in the athletic department. And yet you are <laughs> trying to press yourself to do this insane cycle for lives campaign this fall. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, thanks, Matthew. So I'm going to start in Los Angeles, make my way down to San Diego, over to Phoenix, up to 
Albuquerque and then down through Texas, Louisiana, Florida, and then up north to uh, through Philadelphia, you know, and then into New York. So 5,500 miles, about 25 major markets, stopping at different um, hospice centers, research centers, care centers, hospitals along the way, going to visit with some doctors and patients and raise some awareness, do some media to try to help different um, organizations raise a little bit more awareness or something. I'm going to be visiting with uh, quite a few of the book subjects along the way. That's the way I made my route. And I'm not going to be lollygagging. I got I got kids and life and work and all of that too. So I'm going to get this done in eight weeks. So it's roughly 100 miles a day, uh, 56 days. So I'm going to take a day off maybe or two along the way. But I'm going to be booking from city to city on my bike and um, make it there from here to New York the long way in about eight weeks and then um, get back to work, continue to um, talk to my book subjects and hopefully by about the spring or summer of 2017 come out with a book that I, that I think will, uh, will will help people. Again, Underachiever is your hashtag for tonight's broadcast and interview. <laughs> Very aspirational stuff, and uh, I think our, our Kenny drives a car 5,500 miles. This is a bike in the opposite direction for 5,500 miles. Really inspiring stuff. Um, well, if you could do anything for me, Matthew, you could hope for a for a west to east wind, a little backwind, a little wind behind me would do would do me good for well, for a few weeks. Well, yeah, I mean, west to east is always faster than east to west, so I yeah, think yeah. you may have the tra- the tailwind to, to to help you out there. <laughs> exactly. Sorry. So is there a website yet for this or where can people learn more or not yet? Yes. Thank you. There is. Um, the, 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 the organization we set up, it's a nonprofit. It's, it's um, uh, you know, just for awareness or whatever. Um, uh, you know, the, um, the website is cycleoflives.org uh, or on Facebook, it's Cycle of Lives. Um, or, um, yeah, that's probably the best way. I'm on Twitter and Instagram and all those other things, but I think cycleallives.org, the website, will tell people what we're doing and and uh, you know should should be pretty cool. All right, David Richmond uh, preparing for, for a 5,000 mile solo bike ride across America, west to east, writing a book chronicling 15 people's emotional journeys dealing with cancer. Uh, cycleoflives.org. David, not the last time we will be speaking. Thank you so much for joining awesome. us tonight. Awesome. Thank you, Matthew. Continue to do what you're doing. The momentum is awesome. All right. Thank you. David Thank you. All right. Now it is time for our closing sequence. Prepare to activate. Uh, I hear there's rumors on the uh, internets. You ever seen a grown man naked? And so, to all of you, a fond farewell. Hooray, I'm helping. You are a meathead. Oh, Magoo, you got it again. That was so terrible, I think you gave me cancer. Okay, folks, that's our show. The 373rd episode of The Stupid Cancer Show. Never miss an episode by subscribing to the podcast on iTunes and following us on SoundCloud. I'd like to thank our guests, Sophie Vanderstrop and David Richmond, for joining us on this episode of The Stupid Cancer Show. Broadcasting since 2007, The Stupid Cancer Show is a production of Stupid Cancer, the largest charity comprehensively addressing young adult cancer online at stupidcancer.org. Coming to you from the chemo deck. And on behalf of my team here at the Stupid Cancer Show, we hope you had as much fun as we did. Poking a stick at Stupid Cancer. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you back here on the next exciting podcast of the Stupid Cancer Show. Goodbye, folks. Imagine having